first baby boomers were born in 1945. The last ones were born in 1964. Guess what they're doing now? They're, remember, we all had 401ks, and then there were 201ks and 101ks. <laughs> well, they're 401ks again. And the baby boomers are saying, Yahoo! Time to go home. And they are retiring. And we have got a lot of, especially manufacturers, especially people looking for skilled uh, trades who can't find the workers they need right now. I get asked over and over again, are we going to be, as a community, as a, are we going to be able to meet increased legislative and regulatory pressures? And the really interesting thing about this for most companies is that it's not just, I mean, we can talk about regulation by governments around the world, especially as you go global. Some of the strictest regulations now for supply chain, for example, are being imposed by your customers. If you're selling to Walmart, General Electric, if you are sourcing clothing from Bangladesh, you better have somebody on the ground looking at that factory and making sure what's going on there. It's de facto regulation. It's not from a government body, but it is just as important, maybe more important. I get asked over and over again, are we gonna be able to control costs? Because the way this recovery happened there were commodity prices spiked early, energy prices went up, they're down now. And so what we had is we had a bunch of people who were seeing better revenues but were unable to feel like they had pricing power. So you had lots of people very concerned about this. And the biggest question is, are we going to be competitive today as a company in this region? Will we be competitive next year? What do we need to do to make sure that happens? So we've got all those external factors. There's lots of other things, which I just want to touch on, that make your jobs as leaders in the organizations you run and in the community, it is fundamentally tougher now than it has been before. And there's, a few, there's lots of reasons for that. A couple specifically I want to talk about is that we now know that technology, I mean, how many people here uh, looked at their phone at least once tonight? Okay, so sorry. sorry. How many people didn't look at their phone at least once tonight? There's a few of you. Technology allows us to work 24-7, okay? But what's really interesting is there's an increasing amount of research on brain activity and creativity that says this whole myth that, you know, multitasking, it's not true. There's a 25 to 40 percent switching cost in your productivity and in your creativity when you switch from one task to another. And that is why you're seeing some companies that actually have an email free hours or making sure, you know, you'll see people go out to dinner and they, they stack the phones up on the table and the first person who reaches through their phone has to pay for the check. <laughs> <laughs> We're also seeing that we've got a different social contract. You know, we used to have a command and control architecture in terms of most organizations, you know, you did this, you did that. That's gone by the wayside. I can tell you that we've studied, we, do, we study management around the world. In a developed economy, in a westernized economy, hierarchical structures do not compete well. The only thing we see that works well is decentralized, putting decision making close to customers. And what has happened is that over the last 20 or 30 years, we have all been telling our kids, you can't count a company to take care of you. The only skills you're going to have, the only portfolio you're going to have is a skill, you know, you've got to have a portfolio of skills in your head. You can't count on it. And against all odds, and even with the eye rolling, our kids actually listen to us. <laughs> and now when you are trying to get this generation, millennials, whichever one generation you're looking at, the social contract is different now. They are asking themselves, what are you giving me as an employer? What do I owe you? because you're not going to necessarily be loyal to me for the rest of my life, which means why should I be loyal to you over this period of time? And that makes it much more difficult for us as leaders because it makes us not people telling people what to do. It makes us trying to explain to people why this is in their best interest, which is why running a company is starting to look more like running a community at this point. You can't just tell people what to do. And what we have found over and over again is it's deceptively simple. There are three things that when we look at great companies, when we look at the leaders in them, when we look at great communities that people focus on. They focus on innovation, talent, and process. Now these are like elements. There's a lot of nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen in this room. It's just lying there. It's not doing much. But when you have a catalyst, when you have next generation leadership, when you think differently, you create something great with those things. 
So what do we mean by innovation? Just really quickly. We mean, are you developing, making, and delivering new value? If you're a company, it could be a product, a service, if you're a community, what are you doing differently for the people who are already there and for the people you want to attract at a rate that's faster than your competition? We talk about talent. Are you getting a competitive advantage by getting the right people in your community, getting the right people in your organization, keeping them there, training them, making them more productive? And process, are you getting productivity gains that outstrip the competition? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. I know we've got a lot of manufacturers in the room, and I love Six Sigma, and I love lean theory of constraints and all that, but we think about process a little more differently. A little better, but a little more differently. We think about it differently. <laughs> so what we find over and over again in every sphere where value is a matter, whether it's a community, whether it's a company, is that innovation, creating new value, is based on customer value. And I know that sounds like, well, John, that's a really duh moment. By the way, duh and aha both have the same number of letters, so you can use them interchangeably. Um, but what I mean by that is that over and over again, we find that customer value is fundamentally determined at the point of the end user, meaning it doesn't matter if that person is 20 steps away from you. If they don't see customer value in what you did, it didn't have value. It's the development efforts that I see that don't work are the ones where they're going to do everything. You know, we're just going to support everybody. You know, nobody's got enough money, time, or, or ability to do that. Or the other ones that are worse. Are, uh, I remember about seven, eight, maybe it's ten years ago, I was walking out doing a speaking in a lot of communities, and I don't think I went anywhere that didn't tell me they were the next biotech capital of the world. And I knew even at the time that they couldn't all be right because they didn't all have it. So you have to take some grounded, uh, real grounded look. I mentioned we did a year-long study in Wisconsin, and we looked at every single industry in Wisconsin that had over 100 employees. And we figured out that there were 37 industries that were what we call driver industries in that state. And what that means, because I love Think Local, because you should keep the money here. Even better than a local dollar is a dollar you get from somebody else to send it to you here. <laughs> And so driver industries are those industries where you're more competitive than, you, than people around the rest of the country or around the world. And you're not only keeping your own money, you're getting them to send their money to you here. And that is, those are the industries you want to focus on because that is a great thing. 